Miss Bangler. I thought I was going to be a teacher, put my stuff on a cart and push my stuff room to room. Become an apprentice. You can't just trust the what you're seeing on YouTube. All right, well, thanks so much. Thank Mr. you very Steve much. Spangler. Just for those of you who are watching who don't know who Steve is, mm -hmm. I've actually been a, a fan of yours uh, through YouTube, watching some of your science videos. I've shown some of them to my kids, and we purchased mm -hmm. a, a product of yours, the solar bag, is that mm -hmm. what it's called? Yeah. Just Did, you, did you let it go and accidentally have an F-16 show up over the house, or? So I admit, I bought it in the winter time, and I've been saving it for the summertime to use it, Yeah. and I forgot about it until I saw you at this event. Oh so I, I know where it is. And I'm so, so let's tell the viewers what it is. This yeah. is a bag that's three feet in diameter. Like, think of a trash bag. Super thin black, mm -hmm. but it's 50 feet. Did you buy the 50 footer? The long yeah. one, yeah. It's 50 feet long. So when you run in the park and you scoop up some air and then tie it off, immediately the sun heats the air inside the bag. The, begin the bag stretches just a little bit so it looks like this sausage. So it's a solar sausage and it mm -hmm. begins to levitate and floats in the air and so you get this beautiful now you have to tether it that's what i'm saying otherwise you're going to release a 50 foot black ufo uh, <laughs> and and i have a feeling that you'll get some f-16s that will show up so and, uh, the morning's the best time is that right morning's great because you want the outside temperature now we're geeking out people are looking at this going what is going on mm -hmm. the outside temperature you want to be colder of course than the bag and that you want the greatest differential to give you some lift on it it is amazing Fantastic. It's truly amazing. All right, so you obviously, you're a science guy. What's what's your background? Have you always been in, in science? Is that your education? And then you start teaching? or? So I uh, thought I was going to be a teacher. I'm going to teach chemistry, so I have a biochemistry degree from the University of Colorado at Boulder. I took I took some you understand? old chem, biochem. You got it. And, um, and started down that path. And one thing, like, I even knew the high school they wanted to teach at. I was inspired by this wonderful chemistry teacher uh, in Littleton, uh, Littleton, Colorado. And so I thought, you know what? I had always been taught great teachers are made by the teacher next door. Mm -hmm. And I wasn't a great teacher, I was a brand new teacher. And so why not get to learn from him? And he probably had four or five more years before retiring. Long story short, I got offered a job in elementary school in the Littleton area. And so I said yes. And I was in the classroom for 11 years. Wow. Yeah. As I tell the story on stage, the principal was brilliant, super, super smart. She always knew that I would never have a classroom. She always knew that she would, I would put my stuff on a cart and push my stuff room to room because she wanted me to interact with 27 amazing teachers. See, one of the things that we do as a disservice in education is we take a teacher who's young and put him or her in a classroom, shut the door, and then we give them a cake 30 years later and say, you did a great job, you know? And sometimes they go to a conference, sometimes they don't. We don't get to see each other do what we do best, and that's teach. And when you hit that 15, 20 year mark, you're in your stride. If you're not a good teacher, you're out. It's too hard to be an educator, but when you're great, you're in your stride, I want to see you in your stride. So how wonderful for me to get to see an entire staff of wonderful teachers. So it was the greatest gift anybody ever yeah. gave me. So you did that for 11 years? For 11 years. And time, um, NBC uh, was doing, NBC television was doing a program. I don't know if you know this, but teachers make so much money that sometimes we get another job. Mm -hmm. And so I was doing library shows on the weekends and I was taking my little science stuff and going and doing birthday parties or whatever. A producer from NBC, a freelance producer, was in Denver, took her kid to a library show that I was doing. She approached me afterwards and she said, are you interested in doing television? I don't know, sure, I guess I'm interested in doing television. So I got a chance to be a part of a program called News for Kids. And I had a three minute spot turned into a, it was a local show for Denver first and it became a nationally syndicated show. So all the owned and operated NBCs carried the show and that was in the 1990s. So I was able to go back to my school district to my principal and say, so I get this television gig too, what else? Could, and she said, run Forrest, run, you know? <laughs> and so, but I got a chance to maintain that relationship with the school, continue my job at the school, but in an amended kind of teaching schedule. That's cool. So I still got a chance, and to this very day, I'm still under contract with the Littleton Public Schools in Colorado because three, four times a month, I still get to go kick open the door, uh, work on material. It sounds like a stand-up comedian or an mm -hmm. entertainer, but I truly think of it as working on material. We're like creating that. experiences for kids, 
And when we create experiences, we got to work through this process. It's not just gee whiz bang. Mm -hmm. There has to be a method to the madness. And if you can do it seamlessly, I think that's what separates the masters from people who just dabble at it. Mm -hmm. you know? So what's your main focus today? Well, it's kind of a loaded question. We just were acquired. So Steve Spangler Science has been a product company. You know, that joke about you get another job, but there's truth to that. So we, my wife and I had started a product business in the early 90s under the name Steve Spangler Science, stuff that I was inventing in the classroom, stuff like that solar bag that you were playing with. And uh, over the course of 25 years, we've done over 350 products and kits. Wow. So that business, 25 years old, was recently acquired by a company called Really Good Stuff. Really Good Stuff is in a conglomerate from Excelligence Learning Corporation, uh, lots of stuff. Mm -hmm. But big things like EPI and Discount School Supply and Frog Street and all these other, they're a part of that. So we're very honored that our brand was purchased. And so now all the product business is with Really Good Stuff. And I still have my hand in creating new product for them, but they really are a huge company. 85% of all the elementary schools in the United States Is that a kind of a really weight stuff. off your shoulders, not having to manage that? Or? You know what, uh, people have asked that, and I never thought of it as a weight as much as I thought of it as, what a wonderful opportunity, because this is what they do well. And I think in life, I'm 51, so one of the things I wish I would have learned early on is to surround yourself with people who are really experts in these areas and trust them. Trust the process and trust them and say, you run with it. As an entrepreneur, we do it all ourselves. That's exactly what we do, you know? Yeah. And yeah, I think you have to to some extent, but these people do what they do extremely well, and I still get to invent my stuff, and I think I do that okay, and mm -hmm. so I think it's a wonderful partnership. So I get to really focus on professional development for educators. We're here at the NSA meeting, so I do a lot of corporate work now. Mm -hmm. Who would have thought a science guy who blew things up on stage and Ellen Show and whatever else and mm -hmm. lots of television, would one day, YouTube, would one day uh, be advising corporations on the science of engagement. How do we engage our customers? How do teachers engage students the same way that a CEO or a sales team engages a customer? What do we expect out of those things? We expect an experience. Mm -hmm. And experience, as they say, is the new product. And so experiences change behaviors. They change the way people think. And I that's like what that. we're trying to do, right? Oh, yeah. We're trying to create, an, we all are, at a certain point in time, you have to stop and say, why am I here doing this? And we go back and you look at the lineage, it's always because of a teacher. It doesn't have to be a formal teacher, it could be an informal, but a person, a human being inspired you to do what you're doing now. Absolutely. That's really important for a brand to learn. I think that's really cool that, that you're still going back into the classroom yeah. creating those experiences and, and obviously working at corporate levels. I saw the, the clip, or maybe there's multiple of you on, on Ellen. Oh. So you're obviously on, on big stages and the small stages. It's been fun. Is the Was there kind of a point where you decided, I'm going to do a lot more speaking, or has it just kind of been a gradual change? Uh, so, I mean, we go back to teaching again. That whole premise, if we're hanging something on, is there had to be multiple areas to be able to work on your craft. And so the classroom, you could work on it. Television, I was learning television in the early 90s, but I got an opportunity to be on a school circuit as well. When you can go into a school and you've got a program to do in a school, so I had a 55 minute assembly program. Back in the 90s, kids still had speakers come into schools. Time wasn't as constrained as it is now. And so I really could book in the Colorado area, and Colorado is a big state, I could do five programs a day, five one-hour programs a wow. day, four days a week, 120 schools a year. And so you practice as a speaker. Oh, yeah. I don't know anybody who can get better at anything they do unless they do a lot of it, right? Can't be a great soccer player, piano player, or whatever, unless you're doing it all the time. I don't know how a speaker could ever do this without uh, speaking. So I had logged 4,500 school programs by 2003. So from 1991 to 2003, I had about 4,500 under my belt. So it helped me I'd earn say. my chops. <laughs> but speaking to, to youth audiences, and I'll be perfectly honest with you, they're far more brutal than any corporate audience. This is gorgeous. We're at a Hilton right now. Mm -hmm. You walk into a ballroom, there's food. You walk into a gymnasium of sweaty kids. Mm -hmm. they're, they're going, look, we could either play dodgeball or watch this guy. I'd rather play dodgeball. So somehow you had to learn how to engage, how to connect, and how to create an experience. 
we call that a best day ever moment. And so that's what I'm traveling with right now and talking about a new book coming out called Best Day Ever. We're talking about what it's like when a kid wraps his or her arms around you as a teacher and goes, best day ever. And sometimes we don't even know why. You know, you look at it and go, I don't know, we just had glue today. We had glue and paper and what, and the kid's like, this was the best. And we don't know when a kid has a best day ever. But at the corporate level, I'd sure like to know when an employee has a best day ever. What does that look like? Is it extra time off? Is it a little something in the paycheck? Is it acknowledgement for what they've given and what they mm-hmm. contribute? What are the elements that create these best day ever moments? I think I like it's powerful. That. So as I, as I'm, because I'm a, I'm a brand new speaker. And is I something that I take away from what you're saying? Because a lot of times I, I would think I, I should focus on myself, what I'm saying, and just think, but if I can focus on who I'm speaking to, and you mentioned the experience, just help them have an experience. How do you craft that? It's a wonderful thing to think about. How do we craft those experiences for our audience? Because truly, if you just stop everything and say, why am I here? If you're not happy, ask yourself the same question. Why am I here? What got me to a point where I'm not happy? Mm-hmm. I, I have three boys. I have twins that are 16 now and a 19-year-old at the University of Puget Sound. He'll be a, a sophomore this year. It's funny because they're at that point where we can start to talk a little bit differently with one another. One another. And one of my boys said, Dad, you've never had a job, have you? And we look at it like, no, buddy, I've had lots of... But they don't mm-hmm. see this as a job. This is something that you really like to do. And, and I think mm-hmm. it puts some pressure on them. I asked him, because I did the bad dad thing, saying, what do you think you want to do when you grow up? And uh, my oldest looked at me and said, just want to be good at something. I want to be really good at something. And I said, well, I don't understand what that means. And he said, I'd like to be the best at whatever it is I decide to do. I just want to be really good. He says, all your friends are really good at what they do because he's been surrounded by this all yeah. the time. These speakers, 2,500 speakers and teachers and entrepreneurs and he sees people who love to do what they do. Why in the world would you ever wake up in the morning and not do what you want to do? If you can have a best day ever every day, here's the funny thing. Yeah. Ask a kid like a five-year-old, when's the last time you had a best day ever? And they'll look at you and go, today? And you go, oh, what was the, they, they, they don't even know why. The younger they are, they can have three best day ever moments in the same lunch period. And you ask an adult and sometimes we fumble around and say, I guess I got married, uh, maybe I had kids, and you go, no, no, no. You know what kids can do that adults forget? Is they say the word so far at the very end. Mm -hmm. Best day ever so far, I just don't know what's gonna happen in an hour from now. Might be better. Mm -hmm. And of course it is, because they're selective about the experiences and they cut fast. When you can fish and cut bait and you're not catching anything, a five-year-old goes, I'm out of here. Let's go to another pond. But adults, sometimes we're in the same thing and we go, well, got my master's, guess I need to keep doing this. So how can an adult make that shift back to that childlike attitude of best day ever? I think we have to start looking through their eyes to see how they do it. And very honestly, a kid cuts bait pretty quickly and starts fishing another place. I think it's my job as a parent to help my kid find the pond that's biting the most. Where's his spark? What's the most exciting thing? And if I can help him find his spark, by the time he's 18, 20, I don't want a kid living in my basement at 34, you know? I gotta help him find his spark. But then Peter Benson from the Search Institute, Peter has since passed, but he had a great advice. He said, every kid needs three things. You need a spark, pretty hard to find, but if you can find that thing, you go, music is my thing, soccer's my, whatever it is. You need a champion and you need support. And so here was the killer from, from Peter Benson. The champion can't be your parents. And you go, no, no, I'm going to champion the cause. And you go, no, because parents try to course correct. Mm-hmm. They're like, no, you don't want to be a teacher. You want to be in software development. <laughs> and the kid's like, well, I guess I should be in software development. You need a champion outside of that. It could be family, friends, coaches, somebody from church, whatever it is that you have, whatever that. But it has to be outside the parents, Peter said. And then the parents step in when you're there for support. Once somebody's championed the cause and said, I think you should be an artist, you should get a philosophy degree, whatever it might be, then the parents step in and say, how can I help support and get you to that point? I like that. I think it's beautiful. And ask me in a couple of years if it's working. Yeah. So I'm trying, <laughs> but it's so hard. Nobody teaches you how to do this with your kids. And as speakers and being in the business long enough, I think that we stop every once in a while to reflect. Mm-hmm. And instead of trying to do what's my latest video that's coming out and what am I putting on my social feed and is my Instagram doing well and whatever, this is an opportunity like we're here today just to reflect a little bit and mm-hmm. just take it in and say, so what's next? Awesome.
Things really valuable. Well, hey, to, to switch gears for a little bit. Okay. I'm a YouTuber guy. I know. <laughs> and I've seen... Uh, You're an amazing YouTuber. Uh, thank you. I've seen, you know, you've got a half a million subscribers on your channel, the, the Spangler Effect, is we that right? We have three channels, so really okay. we have about 1.8 million subscribers on three channels and collectively about 280 million viewers. So talk about Which why Which is tiny compared three? to guys like you. Why three channels? Okay, so I'm an early YouTuber. Mm -hmm. My Mentos and Diet Coke video hit when YouTube was three months old. Wow. So really my claim to fame from a YouTube standpoint is I'm just the guy who popularized the Mentos and the Diet Coke. I had there's no others idea. I've that seen that of course. <laughs> came along and so there's guys back east that have lab coats and they're pushing it all over the place. But it all goes back to the one video that was posted in September 2005, the original Mentos and Diet Coke. And that's the original experience that finally got the attention of Profetti Van Mel people who own Mentos to finally return a call. Mm -hmm. I had tried for three years and they weren't interested in 2001 and 2003, 2004. But when that video hit, and back in the day, 2005, September 2005, YouTube being so young, I was told anyway that from the YouTube people that 10,000 views in a day was considered a viral video or what. But what was viral back then? You know, now you have to have millions and hours, right? With incredible engagement. But I mention it just because we found some way to engage differently. I was a live in person kind of thing. I had to come see you at an event. And here was this medium called YouTube where not only could I show something, but then for so many years, kids have been told, don't try this at home. No experiment should you try at home. And now kids are like, I'll get these quirky things called Mentos. What are those? Mm -hmm. Pretty famous now. Yeah. And drop them in. And why Diet Coke? Go ahead, ask me, say, why Diet Coke? Why Diet Coke? I'm so glad you asked. <laughs> Diet Coke because the news anchor, Kim Christensen from KUSA, I worked for the NBC affiliate in Denver. She was in front of the bottle of Diet Coke. I was in front of the bottle of Diet Pepsi. Always diet. Why? Because it's not sticky. Not because it shoots hmm. up higher. It has nothing to do with that. But it's not sticky because there's no no sugar. Awesome. She doesn't step back fast enough. Puts her hand here. Comes up. Hits her splashes. Live TV. She does it two more times with a diet root beer over here. And so by the time we're done with the segment, she's just a drenched mess. Live television. She had four more newscasts to do. She had the 5 o'clock, 6 o'clock, 9 and 10 o'clock in Denver. Not a bad market. We're number 16, so there's a little attraction there. But who cares? There was this thing called the Internet. I mean, every time we came back from commercial, they were like, look at what Steve Spangler did to Kim Christensen. <laughs> it was Mentos and Diet Coke. They said it over and over. And when the Internet got a hold of it and the Associated Press had that little piece on it, news anchor gets soaked, science experiment goes awry, that kind of thing. That's all it took. So isn't it amazing that no matter how much Pepsi put into that, and they put a lot of money into trying to get science teachers to do diet Pepsi and Mentos, the brand was solidified in social media. So we learned, yeah, I maybe I should had, put I had some wondered, more. why is it just Diet Coke? <laughs> it's not. So my license, uh, so when I was invited to go to Perfetti Van Mel, I thought I was gonna get sued, because I had no permission to do it. I guess I didn't have to have permission, but I had invented this toy called a geyser tube. It dropped the Mentos perfectly, really shot them up nicely and I couldn't get their attention. In January 2006, I got to go see Mentos and they said, what do you want? Perfect. And I said, I'd love to sell your product with this thing I invented and could we bundle the two together? And their brand people said yes. So from a YouTube standpoint, we just kept on loading channels and, and loading content. And we only had one channel. And as soon as we were approached by Google in 2010, and they said, we'd love to talk to you if you'll send this in, sign this NDA about this thing we're doing with YouTube and maybe creating some additional content. And they invited us through an interview process to be a part of the original 100 content creators. Wow. So who would have thought that a little tiny science company in Englewood, Colorado would get selected? Warner Brothers was doing their thing and all these big names. And for some reason they selected us and so we got to be one of the 100 we were funded and that's where the spangler effect was born gotcha but we couldn't put the spangler effect on the six science channel because we'd come out with all this content called six science that's a whole nother story so if you go to youtube.com slash steve spangler science it also because the wizards at youtube they also made it six science and we had 256 science videos that were shot in a very different format that nobody had seen before mm -hmm. now very popular with just showing the hands and just showing the experiment the white background and that blown out thing but in 2010 go back and look there was nothing there mm -hmm. and so 
people who wanted to digest that content didn't want to see the Spangler Effect, and the Spangler Effect people didn't want to see our third channel called Spangler Science TV. And those are all the TV appearances. Every week when I do the NBC stuff, or we're at a local affiliate, or at the Ellen Show, and she's been wonderful, all the appearances on Ellen, all the Today Show, all that kind of stuff, Fox and Friends, that all goes on that separate channel. So at the time, we divided the content because we figured people wanted to consume it differently. I don't know if that's a smart strategy anymore. There's people looking here going, I, you you didn't even know maybe there was another channel so you're right one of those channels does have about 580,000 subscribers but the other channel has a little over 500,000 subscribers and the last one about 350 so yeah if you add them all up along the way we've just divided the content nice but I'm not saying that's the right way to do it you you're the guy mm -hmm. I'm just guy early on playing the game that's awesome that's a great story now today what results are you seeing from YouTube in terms of getting more speaking or selling more products? I think it's hard to tell. So if you're trying to look at it from a business perspective, you know, there are people there, it's weird producing content for YouTube because the moment we finished the Six Science Project, this wasn't something that I was going to produce millions of videos, even thousands of videos. We have 1,800 videos loaded in the three channels. But that was always a defined project of 250 videos. So when we stopped producing Six Science stuff, uh, the people are like, Six Science is dead and you haven't produced anymore and blah, blah, blah. And you're like, hey guys, that was just all the content I was going to produce. We need Six Science 2.0 and you go, I'm not doing it. This is what we did. And so from that standpoint, that's a body of work that's still out there. Schools all over the country use our Six Science videos as part of it. And now there's a curriculum that has been written wow. around the Six Science videos. So from that standpoint, I get a lot of invitations to go and to speak at a district level or to talk to teachers about effective ways to engage kids in the classroom using video. And the others are, I mean, the Spangler effect, that's what YouTube paid for. That's the content they commissioned. We did uh, two years, so 68 episodes of the Spangler Effect. Ultimately, when Fox approached us to do DIY Sci, or they approached and said, would you like to do a, a syndicated show uh, through Rotfeld Productions? And we said yes. And so we used the Spangler Effect as the template and turned it into that show. So the spin-off of that show is we got a show on syndicated television that goes into a hundred million homes or so called DIY Sci. So that was awesome. fun. So it, it just adds authority. And I think from a speaker standpoint, if you're an expert in an area, I shouldn't be able to go to your YouTube channel and absorb or digest all of your content in one sitting. If you truly are an expert and I binge, I shouldn't be able to get through everything, right? Right. And so if you have that much content, I think that helps to establish your body of work. And for a buyer on the other end to go, is he or she truly the expert we need to bring in to talk to us about solving this problem? It builds that credibility. And it does. Some authority, some credibility. It's the greatest demo reel you could ever imagine. In this world of professional speakers, some, don't tell anybody this, but sometimes the demo reel is a little bit better than what you see on stage. Not always. <laughs> so how about, like, I get a body of work. How about something that's even a little bit more than that great sizzle reel that you spent five grand to have somebody edit up for you? Mm -hmm. So it's, it's been great all the way around. It pushes me. We continue... To, uh, to do and we'll we'll be releasing uh, more stuff on the Spangler Effect that's not a dead channel at all so that's growing as awesome. well so that's nice of you to be able to tell people about all three channels yeah so I've got one final question for you to kind of tie this all together if somebody were to look at your career and say I want to do what Steve does and you've kind of talked about the journey you've taken from being a teacher and all the, the things that you've done if somebody were to start today, is there anything different that they should do today or any changes that you would recommend based on the road that you took? Yeah. Uh, today, uh, when I started doing this uh, fresh out of college in 1989, so really jumped into this in about 1990 or so, started speaking, doing those school shows mm -hmm. in 1990, you couldn't get a degree. There's no such thing as a science communicator. Today, in universities all over the world, you can be a science communicator. What does that mean? I don't know. But I think it's pretty awesome, right? That does sound so how do I effectively communicate scientific content? And I would love to learn how to do that. So if you're truly were trying to learn what we're what I'm doing, I think the other piece is I wouldn't steer away from the education platform. 
if you are going to speak in front of a group of educators, I think you have to earn the right to do that. Just because you have good ideas doesn't mean that you understand what's going on in the classroom. Mm -hmm. And you don't have to have been in the classroom for 30 years to have earned that respect. So I think that you've got to have, um, you've got to have a sense of, if you're going to speak to educators, then you probably have to have some education background, like you probably should teach for a while. And even though I only taught in the classroom for 11 years, it earned me the pedigree, so to speak, on the road, so to speak, you know, I, I, I had cockpit time, mm -hmm. you know, as a pilot might say, to be able to stand in front of a group of teachers and to connect. I think the last part is, if you want to be, if I'm just about talking about speaking, not the product development mm -hmm. side and all the other stuff, it's really completely separate business that was exciting, but from a speaking standpoint, I have a number of people who will come to me or my business manager, Carly Reed, and they'll say, uh, I just want to talk to you about being a speaker and uh, I think I'm gonna do it. And my first question is always, so how many speaking engagements do you have under your belt? And when they say, about four, four or five, but, and you look at them and say, oh, you gotta get 100. So instead of you taking me to lunch, how about you let me take you to the nicest dinner in the world, but get 100 of them under your belt, and then you and I have something really to talk about. If you wanna be a professional speaker, you can't substitute anything for stage time. That yeah. metaphor again, that cockpit time, same as a teacher, same as a professional speaker. You gotta do that. Awesome. If you're looking at just the demonstration part, I think that one of the things I didn't see back then, what I'm seeing now is liability is so much bigger now mm -hmm. and what we do in front of kids. The people that I looked up to, the demonstrators from, you know, uh, when I was a kid, they got away with crap that there's no <laughs> possible. And I'm, I, you know, if you've seen, we celebrated our 20th appearance on The Ellen Show. So if you figure four big demonstrations, so we've done almost 80 things on the Ellen Show, and the Burbank Fire Department's always on their toes. There's a lot of content there, and so from a safety standpoint, and just trying to do crazy things, I think people see it on YouTube, and they're like, we're gonna blow up ping pong balls as well, and they go out and they get a trash can, but they shouldn't have. They go get some liquid nitrogen, they have no idea how to handle it, yeah. throw it in a two liter bottle, and they don't know how to handle it. And the next thing you know, you've seen these disasters. They're trying to pour something. I saw somebody try to do it with rubber balls. A rubber ball will kill you coming out of a trash can. This thing bust open the bottom. They didn't use a 55 gallon drum. So I guess in a weird way, I'm just saying, probably should become an apprentice to somebody. If you really want to do these kinds of science demonstrations, you want to do large scale stuff, you can't just trust the what you're seeing on YouTube. Find somebody, work with them see how that comes together and and always make sure that you don't let the gee whiz overtake the content because at the end of the day we're going back we've arced did you just see that we just arced this whole little thing we just talk. you go back to that connection that best day ever moment and say why are you doing this in the first place we're trying to create experiences that change minds we're trying to influence the next generation of scientists and engineers and by is the juice worth the squeeze and am i letting the gee whiz overtake the content too much. Sorry. Mm -hmm. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you that very much. Thank you very much. Well, hopefully you enjoyed this episode. I really appreciate the wisdom that you shared and the lessons Thanks that, for asking that we talked all the about. Questions. You were great. So if you like this episode, make sure to like, subscribe, and I'll put links to Steve's channel so you can check them out. They're a lot of fun. Thank you.